All right. Good evening, guys. Um, we will not have class in the morning, so I'm I'm making this lecture video for you guys tonight for you to be able to walk through. Uh, it's like we're being in class, and so we will complete chapter two in this lecture. Next week, we will begin chapter three. So don't forget that uh, your homework, your quiz, and all your assignments for chapter two are due Thursday night before midnight. So where we left off Tuesday, we were talking about the external environment. And so, you know, as we look at the external environment, it is the environment outside of the company that does not deal with the company, but the things outside that impact the company in a bunch of different ways. So we're going to start in uh, section 2-3, segments of the general environment. So the general environment is composed of segments that are external to the firm, which is what we just said. So these are these are segments that are outside of the reach of the firm and outside of the influence of the firm. So the challenge of each firm is to scan, monitor, forecast, and assess the elements in each segment and then try to predict their effects on it. So we talked about those four things, scanning, monitoring, forecasting, and then assessing our findings on Tuesday. So effectively using those four areas are vital to a firm's efforts to recognize and evaluate opportunities and threats. So when we think about a company and the things that can impact them in a negative way, we consider those threats. When we think about things that are outside of a company that can allow them to capitalize on them or they can impact them in a positive way, then obviously those are called opportunities. So as we move forward, let's look at the demographic segment. So the demographic segment is concerned with the population size, age structure, geographic distribution, ethnic mix, and income distribution. So, you know, obviously if you are a company and you want to have the biggest impact, then you are going to look for large cities, areas that have a large population size, and that's where you're going to spend the bulk of your advertising, and that's where you're going to Try to emphasize and grow your brand the most. So you think about the Coca-Cola factory in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta was one of the biggest distribution sites in America uh, for Coca-Cola. Why didn't they put their Coca-Cola museum or Coca-Cola factory in uh, Blue Mountain, Mississippi? Well, because there's not a lot of people here. And the access to the factory that it has in Atlanta is astronomically higher than the impact it would have if it were in a smaller town so you know that that really matters is access to people so firms also want to study changes occurring within the populations of different nations so for example 23 percent of japan's citizens are 65 or older while the united states and china won't reach that level until 2036 and we're going to get into that in just a minute we also touched on that on Tuesday. So if we have an aging population and you have people are working longer, so the the average age of the working population is older, the age life expectancy is longer for humans, and so companies have to take that into account, businesses have to take that into account, and that is going to shape the way that they run their business and the way that they try to gain market share. So right here when it talks about age structure, projections suggest life expectancy will surpass 100, which is insane. In some industrialized countries by the second half of this century, roughly triple the lifespan that prevailed worldwide throughout most of human history. And then it gives an example in Japan. So in Japan, uh, in the 50s, they had one of the youngest populations in the world. So it says 45 is now the median age in Japan. That is, that's crazy. That's really young. Uh, but in 2040, they expect that to increase to 55. So with a fertility rate that is below replacement value, another prediction is that by 2040, there would be almost as many Japanese people 100 years or older as there are newborns. So that is, I mean, that's a wild stat. And when you think about it, how can we use that from a, com from a company standpoint? Well, they're going to have to market to older people. So if they're going to have just as many people that are 100 years old as there are newborns, then they're going to have to figure out how do we shape the products that we market and the uh, things that we want to send out to people. How can we 
phrase those things and how can we shift them to make them uh, important for everybody and to make them relevant for everybody. So then we look at geographic distribution. So for example, over the last few decades, the U.S. population has shifted from states in the Northeast and the Great Lakes regions to states in the West, South, and Southwest. So specifically California, Florida, and Texas. California's population has grown by approximately 5 million since 2000. Now, one of the things that I feel like if this book were written in 2021 instead of 2014 is you would even see a bigger shift of people moving from California either to Texas or Florida. And I'll give you a second to think about why that might be. And in my opinion, it's because of the uh, state income tax. So there's no income tax in Florida. And there's no state income tax in Texas. So if you live in California and you make a million dollars a year, then you are getting heavily, heavily, heavily taxed by living in California. If you make that same million dollars in Texas or Florida, there's no estate income tax. So that's a big bonus to people. Uh, and so that's, that's why we've seen a large shift of people moving from specifically California and even New York, some of the higher... Uh, income tax states in America to those states in Texas and Florida that have no state income tax. All right, so we look at income distribution. So of particular interest to firms are the average incomes of households and individuals. For instance, the increase in dual career couples has had a notable effect on average incomes. So think about this. If you are advertising your products and you sell, we'll say Peloton bikes, Okay, a Peloton bike, they run like, I think, $3,500. It would not do you well to go and spend lots of advertising in cities and areas that have low income because people in those areas will not be able to afford that bike on their best day. So you would want to spend most of your advertising dollars and most of your time Sending those things in areas that have a huge uh, wealth distribution. So places like uh, Los Angeles, New York, um, Atlanta, Georgia, large cities with lots of money and people that make lots of money. So, I mean, that that seems rhetorical, like we, it shouldn't even be an option, but it's things that companies have to think about when they're strategizing where to... Uh, advertise their products. Okay, so now let's take a look at the economic environment. So this refers to the nature and the direction of the company, sorry, of the economy in which the firm competes or may compete. And so it is challenging for firms studying the economic environment to predict trends that may occur and then even more so to predict uh, how those will affect them. We are in living proof of that right now in this pandemic. It would be impossible if you had if you had asked 100 different businesses and different industries back in March of 2020 to predict how this pandemic would have affected their business and their industry. I mean, you take the airline industry, for example. It was decimated back in uh, March and April and even into the summer because we just we didn't know much about the virus. And so it would be it was impossible for them to try and predict and plan how long lasting and how detrimental this pandemic would have been to their businesses. And that's what this is saying right here. So there's two reasons for this. So they look at the global recession of 2008 and they see how many problems it created for for companies throughout the world. So you know 2008 that was the uh I want to say that it was the housing market as well as just the job market overall. We went into a big recession, okay? And so companies couldn't hire as many people. Uh, they couldn't afford, some. in some cases, they couldn't afford to keep the employees that they had uh, because people weren't working as much. They didn't have as much money to spend, so consumer demands were down, which it just has this cyclical effect and everything as an Im was impacted negatively because of that. So secondly, the global recovery from the economic shock in 2008 and 9 continued to be persistently slow compared to previous recoveries. Now, if you look 
at the last couple of years up until um, maybe last year or even into this year. The stock market has recovered nicely. It is, I mean, we hit all-time highs a couple of different times in 2020 and even earlier this year, or sorry, late 2020. Um, but it was a slow go at first, especially from 2008 and 2009. And then now, with the pandemic, we are, we're back into a period of uncertainty. And so that uncertainty, it makes everybody nervous. It makes businesses nervous because they don't know what's going to happen to their revenues. It makes consumers nervous because if you don't know where your next dollar is coming from, then you're going to be less likely to go and spend it on frivolous things. So there's, there's all around uncertainty, and it, it just makes people hold their money a little closer to the vest. So this current degree of economic uncertainty suggests the possibilities of slower growth. So when companies are projecting their, their revenues for 2021, I would say that they are taking a very conservative approach to uh, what they're projecting for revenues twofold because they don't want to say, hey, we're going to we're going to just blow it out of the water this year and then that not come to fruition because then they look bad. And it looks like their business is struggling more than they might actually be. So everyone's going to be a lot more conservative as they prepare and head into 2021. Okay, another segment that we want to look at is the political legal segment. So this is something that we're seeing play out right now as we have a change in the guard and the presidency. So the political and legal segment is the arena in which organizations and interest groups compete for attention resources, and a voice in overseeing the body of laws and regulations guiding interactions among nations, as well as between firms and various governmental agencies. So essentially, this is how organizations try to influence governments and how they try to understand the influences of those governments on certain actions. So my dad was the registrar at Northwest Community College when I was in high school and even into college. And so each year, him and other registrars around the state would go to Jackson to the Capitol and they would lobby for certain uh, either spending uh, needs amongst junior colleges or things that they saw that were lacking that they could use help with. And the reason for that lobbying is they wanted to go and build personal relationships with representatives and senators so that whenever money was available, that they might in turn think about them and, and send that money their way. And that's what happens here. So we have lobbying that goes on all the time in Washington. That is, um, that is where probably nine-tenths of things get made. Um, that is all the power, obviously, about certain policies and where money is spent and where money is divided out. Uh, happens in Washington. So these huge lobbyists, they have their futures tied up in being able to convince these uh, legislators to provide them with money. So it's a huge organization. And think about big business. If you have something that is vital to your business and there's a possibility that that's going to get shut down, then you are going to do everything that you can to influence those in power to side with you and to, to do things that will help you. So there at the bottom of the paragraph, commonly firms develop a political strategy to specify how they will study the political and legal segment as well as approaches they might take in order to successfully deal with opportunities and threats that surface within this segment. So that's a, it's a really big thing. And one option or one item that they give here is, online, is gambling. Okay, now online poker and gambling. And that's something that as we look in the current uh, state of our nation in 2021, you see different states that are legalizing gambling. Okay, in this example right here, the state of Nevada had just recently legalized online gambling, online poker and online gambling. So New Jersey and Delaware didn't want to be left out, so they quickly took the same action. And so as a result of Nevada's regulatory change, some of these firms are trying to decide to the, the degree to which those decisions made an opportunity for them. So would it be wise for them to invest in an online gambling presence to be able to gain that market share before anybody else? And so um, 
that last sentence right there. At first, they said that the state may be too small to provide a lucrative online market on a standalone basis. Well, now we know that's not true, especially with the pandemic, because if people can't go to a physical casino to bet, for whatever reason, they are, they are enamored with, with gambling. And so the online option is the best option for them right now. And so we see, you know, there's all these different states that have legalized gambling uh, and specifically online gambling here lately. So we see that this is something that is, uh, it's important to the majority of people. And obviously it's a huge money-making opportunity for uh, casinos and for certain businesses. So it's something that is a draw for everyone and especially the government, they can use the the taxes that they get off of these bets to be able to build things and to have extra money for the for the government. Okay. Next is a socio cultural segment. So this is concerned with the society's attitudes and cultural values. Now, you know, when we think about it, how does attitude or values, how does that uh, benefit or hinder a company? Okay, because attitudes and values form the cornerstone of a society. They often drive demographic, economic, political, and legal, and technological conditions and changes. So we just got through talking about gambling, okay? Um, you know, we as Christians can look to the Bible for... Um, how we should look at gambling and whether or not that's something that we should participate in or whether or not it's something that we um, should abstain from. And so based on our beliefs, we may choose not to participate in gambling. And if there was a large enough presence in a state that felt that gambling was a hindrance to the furtherment of their state and that it went against the values that their state stood for, then they would obviously want to block something like gambling from being passed in their um, in their state. And so that is something that these companies have to look at. So, you know, for, um, for companies that release pollution into the air, there are certain states that have large groups that that is something that they are very passionate about. And they will fight tooth and nail to not let these companies get in and open up uh, factories in their state. And so those companies know that. So they either have to choose, do we want to battle with these people to try and win this uh, right to open a a factory here, or do we want to take uh, the resources and the time and the money that we would spend there and go and open it somewhere else? So the sociocultural segment is one that may not be as important as others, but it still holds uh, weight in a company's choices and decisions on how to make above average returns. Okay, as we keep going, then the technological segment includes the institutions and activities involved in creating new knowledge and translating that knowledge into new outputs, products, processes, and materials. So you think about how quickly technology evolves. I mean, like we talked about Tuesday, by the time a TV, a brand new TV comes out on the market or a brand new computer comes out on the market, within three months, that is no longer the best computer or the best TV on the market. There's constant change and there's constant improvement. So to try to keep up with that rapid pace of technological change, uh, it can be vital for some companies to do that and to stay on the cutting edge. And there can be other companies who say, you know what, we cannot keep up with the changing landscape of technology. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to pick one area and we want to succeed there. And we will just do our very best to gain market share of that one area. And then we'll kind of take a step back from trying to be the overall leader. Okay. And then also in technology, you know, the internet, the internet generates a significant number of opportunities and threats for firms across the world. Now this says by 2016, the estimate is that there will be 3 billion internet users. So that's probably true. Um, And you think the internet is basically the world at your fingertips. So if you're a company and you want to reach the masses, what's the easiest way to do that? To reach them on the internet. So that's something that companies are putting a lot of emphasis on. 
and should be seeing great returns from that if they are marketing effectively. And then the global segment, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but that's just looking at things from basically a 30,000 foot view. All right, so kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Now we're going to look at industry environment analysis. And there's five, five forces of competition. The threat of new entrants, the bargaining power of suppliers, the bargaining power of buyers, the threat of substitute products, and rivalry among competing firms. So when we think about competition, as a consumer, you should love competition amongst um, business. Number one, it causes them to want to be the best they can be. And number two, it wants it causes them to want to do things at the lowest possible cost to produce the best result. So anytime there's competition, it's a good thing. Just like I use the example of Internet in New Albany. Uh, Max South is the loan provider in New Albany. So there's no incentive for them to lower their prices. There's no incentive for them to try and offer faster speeds because they are the only... They're the only internet shop in town, really. And But if there were two or three different companies and they were competing for customers and they were wanting to offer the best deals, then that would be a great thing for the customer. So anytime competition is around, that's a great thing for the customer. So an industry is a group of firms producing products that are close substitutes. So, you know, when we talk about industry, like the airline industry, Delta, United Airlines, Southwest, um, American Airlines. All these companies, they produce the same products, they, pro they provide the same service, and that's an industry, the airline industry, okay? So, and all of those companies can influence one another, either in a good way or in a bad way, and that's one thing that we'll see right here. So, the five forces of competition model, we're going to look at each of these. So, we'll start with the threat of new entrants. So, when we think about... And this is for a company that is trying to enter into an industry where there are already big players and there are already uh, players in that industry. So identifying new entrants is important because that can threaten the market share of existing companies. So say that there was a new airline that was wanting to start up. Delta, Southwest, American, United, they would all take note of that because it's possible that they could steal some market share. And so they would have to be on top of their game and they would have to research that new company to make sure that they're doing all the things that this company wants to do because they don't want anything to slip up and allow that company to gain market share. So it says one reason new entrants pose such a threat is they bring additional production capacity. Unless the demand for a good or service is increasing, additional capacity holds consumers' costs down resulting in less revenue and lower returns. So that means unless there's a whole new crop of people that are wanting to fly on a plane, then by uh, introducing a new competitor, it's only going to force those companies to bring their prices down. And while that's good for the consumer, it's not necessarily good for the business. Okay. So barriers to entry. Firms competing in an industry, especially those earning above average returns, try to develop entry barriers to thwart potential com competitors. So all that's saying is the airline industry doesn't want new competitors. So they have created all of these costs, all these regulations that a new company would have to overcome just to be able to provide that service. And so for some industries, the cost to enter into or the barriers to enter into a new industry are too great for anyone to try and achieve. So for that reason, you don't see new companies. So, you know, in, in the airline industry, there really aren't many new airlines when you think about it over the course of your life. And it's because there's such a great cost that is involved in getting into and getting set up in that industry. Economies of scale. So economies of scales are derived from incremental efficiency improvements through experience as a firm grows larger. So basically, the cost to produce the next unit goes down. So when you think about Apple, the amount of money that it costs to make the iPhone 12 is probably a lot less than the cost it was to make the iPhone original iPhone. And that's because they have economies of scale. They have figured out how to lower production costs while producing even better products. So if you're a new competitor 
in that industry, you don't have those economies of scale. And so you're going to have a lot higher cost than a company that's been doing it for a long time. Product differentiation. So over time, consumers may come to believe that a firm's product is unique. So let's think about Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Okay. Uh, I personally prefer Diet Coke. Never have been a Pepsi fan. I know that some people are the opposite. Um, but when you think of Coke, I would say those are the two things that, that most people come to mind. So if you wanted to introduce a brand new uh, drink, and it's hard for me not to say Coke uh, for everything, but if you wanted to introduce a brand new soft drink, it would be pretty tough to enter into that market to be able to have enough advertising to make it widespread and then to be able to compete on the level with Coca-Cola and Pepsi. It's just, it's, it's most likely not going to be possible. And it's because of how well they have control of the market. And then also capital requirements. So, you know, think about the costs that are involved in entering into an industry overall. It's, it's just, I mean, some of them can be astronomical depending on which industry we're talking about. So because of that, you know, there's certain industries that have a low threat of new entries. All right, lastly, switching costs. So switching costs are the one-time costs customers incur when they buy from a different supplier. The cost of buying new equipment and of retaining employees may be incurred in switching to a new supplier. The best area I can see here is cell phones. So if you have AT&T or if you have Verizon or T-Mobile or um, oh, what's the other one? C Spire, you know, if whenever a new phone comes out, they want to steal customers from their competitors. So what they might do is they might offer to pay your switch fee, give you a new phone, uh, give you a lower price for your plan for a year just to get you over to uh, their business. And by, by stealing those customers, they are in turn stealing market share. So that is something that is huge in the, in the uh, telephone industry. Okay, the bargaining power of suppliers. So a supplier group is powerful when it's dominated by a few large companies and is more concentrated than the industry to which it sells. They have satisfactory substitute products that are not available to industry firms. Industry firms are not a significant customer. Supplier goods are critical to buyers' marketplace success. The effectiveness of suppliers' products creates a high switching cost for industry firms. And then it says it poses a credible threat to integrate forward into the buyer's industry. Credibility is enhanced when suppliers have substantial resources and provide a highly differentiated product. So when a, when a supplier has bargaining power, customers and in certain industry, they, they just do, they have to listen to the suppliers. Okay. And the airline industry is one in which suppliers bargaining power is changing. Though the number of suppliers is low, the demand for major aircrafts are, is also relatively low. So there's more competition because that demand is low and that ends up helping, helping the end consumer. All right. The bargaining power of buyers this is on the other side. So customers are powerful when they purchase a large portion of an industry's total output. Well, that makes sense. The sales of a product being purchased account for a significant portion of the seller's annual revenue. So if you depend on customers to buy your products, then that gives bargaining power to the buyer. Uh, they could switch to another product at little if any cost. So that's why a lot of times uh, AT&T or Verizon, they will work with you to lower your bill because they don't want to see you switch to another provider. And then the industry's product products are undifferentiated or standardized, and the buyers pose a credible threat if they were to integrate backward into the seller's industry. Okay. Another threat is the threat of substitute products. And we all know that. So substitute products are goods or services from outside an industry that perform similar or the same functions as a product that the industry produces. All right, so they give the example of a physical newspaper or a satellite TV, comparing those to uh, an iPad, being able to read the news on the iPad, or being able to watch your TV through satellite, okay, or not through satellite, but um, what is it called over the top, like a YouTube TV, stuff like that. 
So, you know, if YouTube TV sells cheaper product monthly and they give you basically the same channels as direct TV or cable, why would you not switch to them and save money? That's a substitute that offers fairly similar product for a cheaper price. So, I mean, it makes no sense not to switch. And that's what that's talking about. Uh, the intensity of rivalry among competitors. So, I'm going to skip to the second paragraph. Typically, firms seek to differentiate their products from competitors' offerings in ways that customers value and in which firms have a competitive advantage. So, certain companies are going to be the best despite uh, anything that may stand in their way. So, if they have to lower their price to basically not making any profit in order to gain the market share, then that's what they're going to do. And so, who's the winner in that scenario? Well, the end consumer is because we get a lower priced good that is uh, more than likely better made and um, they have to fight it out and they have to worry about who's going to make less profit. So the end consumer is always the beneficiary of competition. Okay. Sometimes, so we're talking about the intensity of rivalry among competitors, uh, there are high exit barriers. So, you know, sometimes companies continue competing in an industry even though the returns of their investing capital are lowering even negative. So think about the airline industry. Say that Delta wanted to get out of the airline industry. Think about the exit barriers and the amount of money they would have to spend to get out of the airline industry. I mean, it would it would shatter them as a company for being able to, to uh, continue. So the high exit barriers are... Uh, something that hinders some companies from getting out of the airline industry. Common exit barriers that firms face, some of them are specialized assets, so assets with values linked to a particular business or location, fixed cost of exits, such as so paying off all your workers to leave, um, things like that, severances, strategic interrelationships, such as those between one business and other parts of a company's operations, uh, emotional barriers, and government and social restrictions. Some of those things cause a company that may want to stop operating in an industry, it causes them not to be able to do that because of the high cost. So so when we think about those things, the uh, threat of new entries, bargaining power of buyers, bargaining power of suppliers, uh, rivalry among competitors, those things happen every day in industry. So if you are wanting to become a leader and you want to stand out and you want to gain market share, you have to navigate or you as a business have to navigate those things successfully and strategically. And so when we look at industry leaders, Coca-Cola, Apple, um, Walmart, they're companies that have done that. And so as we keep going and as we look in chapter three at um let's pull it up here as we look in chapter three at the internal organization so for us to effectively be a company that earns above average returns we need to be able to navigate the external environment so things that are outside of our control but things that we have to keep aware of and make decisions based on as well as handling things inside our organization successfully. So that's all I've got for tonight or for today. Um, don't forget your quiz, your assignments are due today. After that, enjoy your weekend. And on Tuesday, I will be back and we will start chapter three. Hope you guys have a great weekend. See you later.